This is uh, Dr. Christoph Randen from the University of Lausanne and the Botanical Gardens in Lausanne. And he's one of the leading uh, plant ecologists for the mountains in this area, in the Western Alps, in the Pre-Alps. And so he's been studying this area for a long time. He got his PhD on the plants around here. He has doctoral students who are studying the plants around here. He's working uh, with us closely on um, how to develop everything that we're doing here for studying the, the let, what we call the LET study, the local elevation transect survey, studying the vegetation from the, and later the animals also from the valley bottom all the way up to the top of the Tour d'Ailly and over to Diable Ray eventually. And so we're starting this long-term study that you've all heard about in your classes already. And he's here to help guide us along that path. Uh, could somebody please close yeah. that yeah. line there? Thank you. And so he'll give a, a short talk this morning. To, and then a lot of you, some of us are heading off after this one talk because we have a long ways to go to reach our sites. And the rest of you will go down to the black box afterwards. Everybody who's a designated student leader on the on those sheets, um, supposedly you know who you are, there's a checklist that I need to give you and if you could be responsible for that checklist to make sure that we've done everything out on the site and that we've gathered our equipment back again after. Okay, that's the last time I'm going to introduce him. Um, so, so, we'll get started. Welcome, thank you. So good morning. Well, think of, please think of questions so you can ask him some yeah. questions afterwards. So good morning everyone. So thanks for coming. Thanks for this nice broad audience and thanks LAS for the invitation. Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. So thanks for coming and thanks for the invitation. So deeply appreciate it. So my talk will be about so why studying mountain ecosystems. So why working here in this region? And so from that picture, so you have to tell me so shortly why you think it's worth working here. So what do you see on that picture? It's a nice picture. But what are the features that you can see here? Mountains. Trees. Trees. So what kind of trees? Yeah, exactly. Coniferous forest. And what kind of forest can you see at the bottom? So you remember, maybe you, you worked with Dan. Coniferous forest or something else? Yeah, oak forest. So at the bottom you have oak forest, then you have so coniferous forest, and then what do you have higher? Glaciers. Glaciers, and before, between the forest and the glaciers? Mountains. Snow. Snow, yeah, glaciers, snow. snow, but in between. So alpine meadows. <coughs> so basically you have all kind of topographic features, so many, ty many types of topographic features, on many types of, of vegetation. <coughs> so, in contrast, this is a picture taken uh, in Colorado. It's looking towards the prairie, and here what do you see? It's totally flat. You have just the grass. So when it's flat, you have just the grass. So basically what is special here, it's the, the variation of elevation that will change the climate conditions, and which in turn will affect the species composition and the diversity of, of habitat. This is why mountains are special. And if you start from the bottom, so in Aigle, and then you go a little bit higher, just below Lezin, and then even higher, so below the Diablerets. So what, what is the factor that varies the most along elevation? Temperature. temperature, exactly. So if you take again the example of Lezin, 
So you know the elevation of Leza? Here. Yeah, 1350 meters. Okay? So here, on the top of the Todai, 1000 meters higher. So there is almost 1000 uh, meter, uh, a gradient of 1000 meters. I'll just show on this slide yeah. uh, the group I'm going with to the top tree, we're going right up here. And today, here at LS, so the forecasted temperature, so between 8 and 10 a.m., is about, so it's between 6 and 9 degrees. And what about the top of Todai, where you are going to work? Do you know how the temperature uh, varies along elevation? 6 degrees every thousand years. Exactly. So, basically, you will lose. So six degrees, so between eight and ten, it's still freezing here, up there, okay? So why you have, so pretty high temperature above zero degrees, see? So it is still freezing cold at the, on the top of the Tour d'Ai, okay? So this is the range of temperature you will, you will see at the same time. So there is a strong variation of temperature and you lose exactly six degrees every 1,000 meters. And what is interesting is that, so the trend you find along elevation, you can also find it along, so latitude. Where you go across Sweden, for example, it's exactly the same as going across a gradient of 2,500 meters here. So basically, from Aigle to the top of La Bernouse or to the top of Le Diablore, okay? So a short journey for you of 30 minutes is the same as a trip of 2,000 kilometers <coughs> across Europe. So basically, today, your journey from LAS to the top of the Tour d'Ai is the same as a trip from Monaco to uh, the, the, the north of Europe in Denmark. Okay, so remember that. Here you don't need to travel that far to see uh, so the, the ecosystems changing. You know what? So what can you see here? A glacier, yeah. And so you know what this phenomena is called here? This, this cloud? So it's called the, the fern barrier. That's the clouds that will form just before it's a storm. So basically what's going on here uh, in Valis at the moment uh, today. So there is a storm coming and there is a big barrier of clouds and it's called the fern barrier. It's just before uh, a storm. And you can see, so that's in Zermatt. And that's the same phenomena, but see from a satellite. So it's satellite images. So Zermatt is here. You can see this big amount of clouds stuck just below the Alps. So basically, so mountains so will act as a barrier. So they will so catch the clouds and the clouds will get stuck on the top of the mountains and then what's the effect? No. A lot of snow, a lot of rain. So because the mountains on the, 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 the ridge of the Alps so act as a barrier, so it will rain more than expected on the top of the mountains. Of course, it will snow because it's cold and because temperature will vary across elevation, but also because the Alps act as a barrier, so they will grab even more snow and more rain than you can expect. On the other effect, if you see the clouds here and here the valleys, so if all these clouds, so form on the Mediterranean Sea and then you will come here and get stuck here. So what will happen in Valis? Just here. If just look at this, uh, there is the ridge here, many clouds here and here. It will be drier on the other side than it's... Uh... Exactly, yeah. It's called continentality. So climate, so in Valis, will be drier than on the southern ridge of the Alps, and drier than in Lezan, much drier, like three times drier. 
So when it rains 1200, 1500 millimeters a year here, so in the center of valleys, you only get 500 millimeters in Sierra. So almost three times less. And that's also important. So you have this elevation gradient that creates a gradient of temperature, but you have so barrier effects that also create a gradient of climate across the Alps. Another important uh, aspect, if you look at the Kimborazo here in Equator, and if you look at the Southern Alps here, view from the sky, so what do you see? Yeah? The top is covered in snow, the other way for us is Yeah, exactly. The, the top is covered by snow. This is very special here, and not somewhere, el somewhere else around. So we call that islands in the sky. So basically mountains, they are islands in the sky. So they act as individual systems. So here you have very special conditions, and here it's totally flat. So here, just below the snow, so these mountains will carry or hold specific types of vegetation and ecosystems that are isolated so across these different ranges. So they are really islands in the sky. So the systems are more or less connected. So sometimes they are completely isolated. So it's a kind of species factory. So it will generate biodiversity. So and especially for cold adapted species. And of course, and it will be probably for our next talk. So this species, since they are isolated and they live in very specific places, so they are pretty exposed to climate warming. And this is the, the, the types of species on life forms you can find in the mountains. So what kind of so forms or types of species do you see here? Can you describe a little bit with your, with your world? This one, for instance, compared to this one or this one? They're all round. They're all round. Why? It's physics. It's not biology. Yeah, that's a good point. You can hold the water, and if you think about the ratio between the volume on the surface for a sphere, so that's the best ratio between the volume, and so the vegetation volume, on the surface exposed to the climate. This is why they try to create sphere, it's to better cope with the harsh climate. So basically you have what is called a uh, so cushion species, so you have these types of, of cushion. And here in the middle of the cushion, it's really the, you, you find the same condition as in a tropical forest. So temperature around 30 degrees and almost 100% of humidity. So when it's like <coughs> 5 or 10 degrees here, it's already the tropical forest inside the, the cushion. So it's a community of, of clonal plants that live together and they form this cushion to cope with the climate. And this one is exactly the reverse. So the leaves, they are very, very tiny. It's just to, to try to decouple from the wind. When you are totally exposed on the ridge here, so you try to avoid the, the dry effect or the drying effect of the wind. So we have very tiny leaves. And so the stomachs, so the, the, the holes so across the, the plant uh, capture the CO2 is completely inside these tiny leaves. So nothing exposed to the wind. And these two guys here, you are not surprised to see so alpine species that look like these two guys here. What kind of, of type, what types of plants? So to remind you. Cactus, exactly. And you are not surprised to see cactus in the alpine zone. So why do we find cactus plants in the alpine? It's dry, yeah, exactly. In the rocks, even if you have a lot of snow, so on the ridge of the rocks, it's very dry. It's dry and, and super warm. So you know the range of temperature you can find on the dark rock in summer? No idea? You can almost cook an egg. So it's higher than 75 degrees C. So imagine the range of temperature you can experience across the day. So it is freezing cold 
in the morning, and then in the afternoon, around noon, you can reach 75 degrees. So it's a range of 70 degrees. This is why you, you find cactus, so where you can find a lot of snow, a lot of rain. This is a bit of paradox of, of the Alpine. And so, going back to the picture of Lezan, so what kind of elements or what kind of ecosystems do you see here on what, on what kind of boundaries do you see here, an obvious boundary? You take the cable car and you are within the forest and then you are in the mountains, you are in the alpine meadow. So, what is the transition? You have trees and then the grass, the meadow. So I tell you, you cross an important boundary, that is the tree line. So, on why do trees find their limits here? Temperature and oxygen. Temperature, yeah. CO2, you know CO2, so that we used to to growth, it's a big issue. It's still, it's still a big debate. So what's the effect of CO2? There is a decrease of CO2, there is a decrease of, of pressure, but we don't know yet the, the effect of CO2. So on some species, more CO2 means more growth, but on some species, more CO2 means uh, inhibition of, of growth. So we don't know yet what's the effect. But temperature, do you think it's, that's the extreme temperature or just the average temperature? The variation? So it is true for the trees that are below the tree line. So extremes and variation, that explain why so trees, so the tree species have different limits. But there is an absolute limit for the life form trees. And that's actually here. So the mean temperature condition that you find during the growing season. So if you travel around the world, here, you will see many, many different tree lines. And these tree lines are made of different types of species. So for instance, in Tromsø, you have a, lim a tree line limit made of so the, the birch, okay? And, and here, it's another type of species in Italy. And here, on the Kiborazo, you have so evergreen species that form the tree line. And here, you have tree lines. In, in Lezan here, you have tree line, so made of uh, spruce, so larix, huh? or the stone pine. Okay? All, always different species, but always the same factors that explain their limits. So it means that there is an absolute limit for the life form tree independent of the species. So what these guys have done here in this study is that they spread temperature loggers across all the tree lines over the world, okay? And these tree lines are made of different types of, of species. But surprisingly, what they found is that for each of these tree lines, you find the same conditions. So the, at the limit, so the limit of species, of the tree species, is made of, so temperature, or mean temperature during the growing season, that is around 6.5 degrees, and you need at least 90, 90 days so to grow tree at the tree line. If you have less than 90 days with 6.7 degrees, so you don't find trees anymore. So the mean temperature, mean temperature conditions over the summer explain so the disappearance of the trees. So, you know the record in Switzerland? So where do you think we find the highest tree in Switzerland? This is why exploration, this is why going in the, so hiking in the landscape is important. So the, the highest tree uh, in Switzerland has been found in 2011, so in uh, Val d'Arpet, just here, so at the entrance of the Mont Blanc Massif, so at 2,800 uh, meters. So that's the highest tree in Switzerland. 
Okay. And so we, we had to climb actually because I was with Jean-Paul Thuria. So he's responsible of uh, mountain research station. And so we, we climbed uh, the south face of a mountain to look for the highest tree. Because it was believed that the highest tree was in Zermatt at 2,700 meters, a very small tree. And actually we found a pretty high tree, more than one meter high, at 2,800 meters. This is why it's important to observe and to explore the mountains. And that's the record. And so trees are constrained by temperature. And if climate is warming, what do you think will happen to the trees or to the forest? The tree line will go up. Yeah, the tree line will go up. And so the highest trees are currently at 2,800 meters. But the tree line you are talking about, and this is true to talk about tree line, is actually located at 2,200 meters in average here, on the Mont Blanc or in Les Ains, okay? Les Ains is a bit lower because of the continentality effect, so it's wetter, so it's about 1,900, 2,000 meters. But just below the Mont Blanc, so the highest mountains in, in Europe, so the tree line is at 2,200 meters. And in 2030, we expect the tree line to be at 2,700 meters. So the tree line, huh? not the highest trees, the tree line. And then for the end of, so the middle of the century, we expect the tree line to be at 3,500 meters. So it means that, so we might find trees pretty high. So this, this small uh, um, rock is at tr exactly at 3,500 meters. So you can imagine trees here. And so above the tree line, so conditions are a bit different. So what will happen to the plants when you are not protected anymore by the, the trees? I, I heard something? Nothing? So this is a thermal image of an alpine landscape just above the tree line. And here you have the temperature for each so small pieces of the landscape. So they are like pixels of 10 by 10 centimeters. And here you find temperature conditions between zero degrees and 30 degrees at noon during summer. So in summer, for this small part of landscape, you have a variation of temperature of 30 degrees over a very short distance. Basically, where you have the blue here, it's still zero degree, and here it's 30 degrees C at noon. So it means that above the trees, so plant species, so experience very, very harsh conditions, so very cold and very, very warm. So much higher variations that, than if you are protected from the trees. And above the tree line, you have also very contrasted conditions between the slopes. So this is a picture taken in May. So my brother, so he's skiing down this gully, while here on the south facing slope, so the, the vegetation is already starting in May. And then at the micro scale, when it's flat, you always find the same conditions. But at the micro scale, so the harsh conditions, so create a lot of variation of vegetation. Because the species tries to be decoupled from this harsh condition. So a tiny variation of micro topography will create a strong variation of uh, plant composition. So if you have like this kind of uh, depression, you will accumu accumulate snow, decrease the growing season, and favorize so, uh, specialized species that can cope with a lot of snow on a shorter growing season. So when you are completely exposed uh, to the harsh conditions, so if you are not protected by the snow, you have to develop very, very specific uh, strategies. Like these species, like it's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, body armored uh, plant that has very, very uh, thick leaves. And these species can cope with minus 200 degrees. You will never find in, in theory in the nature. But these species, in winter, it can cope with minus 200 degrees. When you, you throw it to uh, liquid nitrogen, so most of the cells will survive. Same types of species, that's, so cushion species. And this is just to show you what I talked about. 
So this is a, a picture just to, to finish. This is a picture taken um, at 5,000 meters in Equator, so on the Iliniza. And this species was completely frozen in the morning. But then when I come back at noon, it was completely unfrozen and it was very warm. So it means that this species should cope with a strong, uh, with strong temperature variation. And here, so what this study has done is that it recorded the temperature inside the cushion and compared the temperature so outside the cushion at, at two meters, so the standard measure of temperature. And you can see that here when it's 10 degrees outside, it's already more than 25 degrees inside with 100% of humidity. So tropical conditions while it's only 10 degrees outside. So, and I think I will finish with that because Thank it's you. already too late. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Dr. Randon? Does it make you understand a bit more what we're doing today and why it's interesting? Yeah. Right. Um, okay, none? One going once, going twice? Yeah. Okay, well the questions will come later. Then. Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much, that was very... When you said... Um, um, 90 days above 6.9, was it? Yeah, over in average, yeah. Right, when you make the average of all the temperature conditions. Mm -hmm. But just to add something, so you, you will climb to the Tour d'Ailly, so from La Berneuse, and there, there are a lot of things that we don't know. For instance, so where, where are the highest trees in the region located? So we don't know where they are located. So they're probably so hidden as the stone pine you saw in the picture. So we don't know what, what's their growth rate. So um, if you react to climate change, for instance. Something uh, Mr. Catton and I have been talking about is through the Alpine Club starting an extreme ecology uh, program so we can go out and do things like look for the highest species, I mean the highest tree around here, the highest of any species in the individuals that we find and on cliff faces and just look for these things and have adventures while we're looking. Yeah, and this is why it's called vertical ecology. And this is very important because the, the very skilled botanists so are very old. So which means that very skilled botanists so do not climb that high. So to be a skilled botanist, usually you need to be old to have accumulated enough knowledge. And usually as old botanists you prefer the trails, easy trails. This is why it's important that young people so explore a little bit the area. Or you stay young as you get old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we're very excited that you're going to the field and uh, do some ecology today. And I hope you'll be enjoying much of this day. And uh, what we want to present to you today is uh, after the talk of uh, Chris on uh, alpine ecology, it's actually what is the, uh, the way that scientists operate to actually do the, their studies. And this is something that you can apply yourself when you're going to, to, to the field. Uh, so uh, this is Anne de Lestrade, uh, she's an ecologist. And I'm uh, Irene Alvarez, and uh, we both work at uh, CREA. So CREA is a research center on ecology, on mountain ecology, and we are based in, uh, in Chamonix, right across the, the valley. And, um, and so we're working on alpine ecology, and we're also doing some uh, sensitization for younger and older people on, uh, on what is mountain ecology and what, why we should care about mountain ecology. So this is a... A picture that you may see through your window, or that we do see through our window in uh, at the uh, in our offices. And um, I don't know, does this ring the bell to, to you? What uh, what comes to your mind when you see a picture uh, a picture like this? Um, for some people, uh, this will be just a huge play field. And this is the case of uh, Walter Bonatti, a very famous alpinist, Italian alpinist. Uh, from the 20th century, that's last century now. 
And um, so he was, you know, going on all of these mountains, in particular the one behind, and um, and writing about uh, about these uh, adventures. Another way of looking at this picture and looking at this landscape is actually to go into the very details of the of the picture and looking at all the flowers or the small insects, and uh, that's probably a, a scientist doing this. And then maybe another way is uh, just because you're more into arts, then you look at this landscape and try to draw it or paint it. So now the question to you is, uh, what is this for you? Like this picture? Um, are you asking yourself a question when you see a picture like this? Are there things that you would want to understand or that come to your mind when you see a picture like this one, a landscape like this? I'm not sure I will get a, an answer, but if you if you have uh, something that comes to your mind, uh, then just uh, tell us. And yeah. I'd like to know if that's the largest bird in history. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, about four meter. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a question for you. What is this we're doing here? Hey, that's a good question. It's, it's a question that I try to answer. Why these birds are living so high in altitude and how they are adapted to this environment? So um, this, what questions, uh, when you see a landscape like this, what comes to your mind? And yeah, if, if you are a scientist, um, you, you try to look at the landscape and you say, okay, uh, here you can see different colors on trees, so why, why the trees are different colors? Maybe that could be a good question for, for scientists. And also maybe, uh, oh, you have, uh, you have vegetation here, but here we have, it seems you have no vegetation at all. So why, because there is vegetation here and not here, for example, <laughs> maybe your answer. <laughs> And, and yes, why is this bird is here, for So, yeah, when you see something, when you see a landscape, when you go to your plots, just let all the questions that come to your mind come and then try to answer them. And so what Anne is telling us is that when she sees a landscape like this, is that uh, she's thinking about ecology, she's asking her questions about ecology. So I think you've heard about ecology in your classes. Um, but just first of, it, first of all, is it a policy or is it a, a science? Uh, it's both of them. But what we are interested in here is uh, ecology as a science. And the ecological science should be the basis of uh, political decisions that are made. Uh, we're uh, hearing a lot about climate. Um, uh, and you heard about uh, uh, maybe the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. So you need scientists to actually make a good decision, uh, make a good policy decision. So what we're studying here is the science of the living, as opposed to physics that uh, is not uh, about uh, life. And, uh, and we're studying biodiversity. And biodiversity is everything from our genes, or any animals or plant genes, to wider ecosystems. And um, Earth in itself is a big uh, ecosystem, a big biosphere. Uh, so biodiversity is everything from the very small to the very big. And Oh yeah, ecosystem is a, is a group of species, uh, and uh, if you add species, it's not an, e an ecosystem. What makes an ecosystem is the interactions between all the species, and the complex interactions. So this is an ecosystem. Does, any know, does anyone know what uh, I'm referring to? Yeah? Human organism? Yeah, exactly. It's a newborn uh, stomach. So what can you see on this picture? Can you see something that looks like life? Yeah, exactly. So this is a whole ecosystem. It's bacteria. And we've got in our, bo in our body 10,000 times more bacteria and foreign um, organisms than our own cells. So this is an ecosystem, and we are an ecosystem uh, uh, ourselves. And uh, this is another ecosystem at a larger scale, right? Uh, this is a human ecosystem. You can see mountains, but you can see also a lot of uh, field. So we are working on the ecosystems and creating new ecosystems like um, um, a wheat field, for example, is an ecosystem. This is the ecosystem that we prefer most, the mountain ecosystem. And this is also an ecosystem. 
or this used to be a different ecosystem and then because of different um, things, mostly human uh, action, it was degraded and uh, it's still an ecosystem, there's still life in there, but much less than it used to be. So basically what we're studying is a very complex, um, fascinating and fragile uh, ecosystems, but it's also very unknown. There's very little we know about biodiversity and uh, about how our earth works. And so what we're doing, what you will be doing in the, in the field today, is really explore life and uh, take it as an adventure. You're going to explore new things. Uh, some of them are known, some of them are not known. So what research is about, we are going to take a research step by step. So first of all, you need a big subject. Uh, and uh, for us, a big subject in alpine ecology is uh, taking one species or a set of species and trying to see their interrelation among themselves and also uh, with different parameters. Some of these parameters are physical, uh, like climate, for example, or topography. Um, there is a, an impact of the mountains being like this rather than being completely flat like a, like a, a plain area. Geology also has an impact because of the soil it creates. So these are external parameters. And there are internal parameters that are um, proper to the, to the species itself, how does the species work, uh, but also the interrelation among species. Where is this species I'm studying, where, where does it stand in the, in the food chain? Is it a, a plant, so primary producer, or is it uh, like a small insect, um, or is it a predator? Um, and so the main question when you have a subject like this uh, that uh, an ecologist will ask uh, himself or herself is why does it work like this and how does it work? So now because we have a scientist with us, I'm going to ask her, ask her what is your subject? What are you studying? Uh, uh, I'm studying the, the impact of tourism on our bodies. Does tourism, tourist activities has impact on our bodies? Maybe you have ideas about this. Do you have an idea? Um, for the skin soaps, for example, if you want to go with the structures. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For skin, for, for example, for skin yeah. results, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can. Uh, yeah? No? <laughs> so once you have a, a question like this, a large question, uh, like does tourism impact uh, the mountain environment, for example, then you need to go much closer to, to a much, much more precise question, and you had already a precise question about one specific activities on a specific area. So, I'm so, going so yeah, for me, I try to understand um, the, does tourist activities, like uh, ski resorts, for example, uh, impact uh, breeding of chaff. Chaff, the, the alpine chaff, it's a bit seasonal. Uh, I try to understand that, uh, uh, for example, French fry like this, uh, available on, uh, on the ski resorts, uh, change the, the breeding date of, of the, of the chaffs. What impact that could be? And so you're having a, a precise question and you have a subject of study, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the subject here, uh, I, choose, I choose this bird because I choose lots of, lots of other species to, to answer to this question. But, okay, I, I look at this bird because this bird is uh, very common in mountain. You can see it here. It is unknown. Nobody has worked on this bird before. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because he uh, has a very... very it's smart behavior and uh, it, like, it likes it moves and there is a lot of things to study so we will just look at one question here but we can have many many questions on the bird just fascinating <laughs> for me and, uh, and it's, it's, it's really opportunistic so it likes to go to see what, what humans uh, are doing and if they, they can find some food because they like lots of food, different food Normally they eat uh, insects or berries in the alpine uh, environment, but uh, yeah, they, they could eat this or lots of things, chocolate. So, <laughs> so you can see them uh, uh, near this building in winter, because I've seen them uh, last time I, I came here. 
and uh, which is uh, very interesting. You, you will you will see what what birds can do here, how they pass in the village, how they go in ski resorts, and uh, and they are they are traveling a lot. And uh, yeah, um, maybe I. So you have uh, one precise question with an hypothesis, which is, does tourism or French fries actually influence the breeding dates of, uh, yeah. of Alpine Chop? So to answer this question, then we need to define a protocol uh, to be able to answer the question. And the protocol has one aim, is to bring data uh, that will help construct the conclusion, right? And so a protocol is a very uh, defined procedure of an experience or an experiment that you will be doing uh, and that needs to be consistent. If you're doing this experiment, if you're doing this experiment, uh, it needs to be exactly the same so we know we have the same data and the same reliable uh, data regardless of the observer. And so it needs to be very consistent, very well defined and you need to repeat it as much time as you need for, uh, to get your, your conclusion uh, and a statistically cons um, significant conclusion. And sometimes you need to be creative to actually get uh, uh, your your protocol right. And I know Anne has been very creative in uh, in doing her protocols, but it's also very repetitive. And sometimes you're just uh, fed up of doing the same protocol. But that's part of the game. And also sometimes you define a protocol and you completely miss your targets because it it doesn't work. So you need to re redo a protocol and do it again. So now, what what is your protocol for? Yeah, to study the impact of uh, tourist activities on breeding of, of this bird, uh, you need to first observe the bird. This is the first, uh, first thing. And, and uh, you have to go on different places where the birds are uh, near tourist activities. But for this, you need to recognize birds to know what birds are breeders or not breeders, and uh, how, many, how many young they are, and uh, where's the nest, and all things. And for this, you need to re recognize the birds because they live in big groups. So if you see one or another, you, you don't recognize them like this. So you need to, to bring them. And uh, first, you need to catch them. So you need to, to put fruits, create a French, fries. a French fries. You need to make fries <laughs> first. You need to, to create your, your system to try to catch them because it's not, uh, it's not uh, abused to catch the bird. And it depends on species. You have lots of techniques to, to catch a bird, but uh, each bird has a speciality to avoid this. <laughs> so you so invented your own system for Yeah, so you have to invent uh, something. So here I have a, I have a net where I put some food on, on the ground, and I have a net which is uh, uh, pull, pulled by, uh, yeah, by cannons. So I have two cannons, small cannons. <laughs> and the net is... Uh, is pull on, on the birds. And I could catch a uh, lot of birds at the same time. And after, I, I, I try to measure the birds, so I need to have lots of information about each bird, what is the weight, what is the length of the bird, etc. And, uh, and I put some mark on them, so just because I need to recognize each bird. And I put some uh, ring color like this, and you have a code for each bird because you have lots of colors and combination. Uh, so for example, for example, this one is, uh, his name is red, white, uh, yellow, green. This is the name of the bird. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's very, very useful. <laughs> they don't choose their name. And this one is white, black, green, green. <laughs> so you've been doing, going so to the field for 30 years to... Yeah. So you mean lots of birds because you need lots of information. Lots of observation because in, in nature uh, there is lots of variation. You so you <coughs> collect lots of data, lot, lot, lot of data to have a conclusion which is consistent. And you need also to do it for long term, for long term. So so I work for 30 years on the bird. Uh, so it could be boring at the end, but because you have al always new questions, it's not boring. <laughs> And so you're using a second tool to test your hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, so you, okay, you have the bird, but you, you need to know uh, the environment, so where they live. And you need to, to obtain, uh, to, to control what's happened on this environment, 
to have some uh, connection between environment and what the bird is doing. So, so here we, we need uh, information about climate in alpine, in alpine ecosystem. So we put uh, automatic station um, and they, they send us uh, data of uh, temperature, for example, or snow. And uh, you have lots, you obtain lots of information that you have to analyze. After. Uh, it's big computation, and uh, and okay, you can see the trends of temperature, for example, over 25 years or 30 years. This is an example of uh, of data you can have. You can have also the tourist frequentation, or maybe you have ideas. What what other parameters you can monitor? to answer to this question. And the uh, amount of birds produced each year? Produced each year? Yeah, yeah. the reproduction oh, yeah. rate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she goes to the nest and, uh, and see, or close to the nest, and then see where how many... Yeah, it's not very easy to go to, this, to the nest of this bird because they are going inside holes, in cliffs, and in high altitude place. So you have to move to walk a lot and, uh, and climb in, in, in the cliffs and, uh, and when you arrive in front of the hole of the nest you, you put the end and sometimes the nest is too far so you, it's two days you do something and you can't reach the nest uh, uh, science is about uh, frustration a bit also so after it's uh, okay i can't access the nest so i need to have uh, an observation which give me the the information i need so what I, what I do, I just stay on feeding place where, where the chops are going to feed. And I look at the bird, the ring birds, and look uh, at what time the, the bird uh, feed young youngs, because they feed the youngs after they leave the nest. So I could have a, um, a date of uh, fledging, you understand that? When the when the youngs leave the nest, because I see them on, on the on outside the, the nest. Okay, so you you need to you can't obtain all the time the good parameter you, you want, but you, you need to to find a way to to have this in in an index of this. So once you have uh, tested all the parameters, then maybe you can find a result. Maybe <laughs> after 25 years you found a resource. Uh, maybe earlier, I hope for you. <laughs> you will find the results uh, this year. But uh, for me, the, it's interesting to have a long term series of, of data. And uh, over these 25 years, what I observed is uh, an advance in breeding dates. So we, we had uh, the birds are leaving the nest, the youngs are leaving the nest. 10, 10 days earlier in, in this process experiment. And how we can explain this? So we are, with all data we have are, we are collected, we can see that uh, we have a correlation between the temperature in, in the April and May and the, the date of fledging. And this is, this is really a very good, uh, very good relationship. And when we look at the other parameters like tourist transplantation, uh, number of rice they eat, or something like this, uh, it's not consistent. There, there, are no, there is no relation between tourist, tourist activities or no frequentation and the date of breeding. So it's mainly explained by temperature. So you had an hypothesis and then you tested it on two parameters and only one of the two parameters is yeah. actually Actually so sometimes you have an hypothesis, but the, the, the answer is not what you expect. It's another parameter which is more important. And, and uh, so, okay, it's a temperature which affects the breeding date. That's the first reason. But uh, why, why is temperature? What, what, what temperature uh, is doing? And uh, we, need to, we need now to go further and find another explanation, another, um, another way to, to answer. So we need more data. And we, we look at the satellite data. This is a, a green index. I don't know if you see, but it's, it's a season 
uh, going on Earth. So you can see flushing. Flushing. So you have the green uh, changing over over a different part of uh, of Earth. And we try to do to look at this on mountain in our place where I study the bird and try to see what how the green. Uh, it's an index of um, of, of, of uh, product grassland activity, so and also of snow melting. So, so you can see in the apps, for example, we hear yeah. uh, okay. how it does between winter and summer. Obviously, the green, if we consider that green is the productivity of what uh, animals can feed on, is very different whether you're in winter or in summer. Yeah, on a small scale, when, when you look at the, at the snow on, on, on the alpine system, you can see some in some place the uh, uh, snow disappears earlier than the other place, and you try to see, to connect, that the, that the birds are going on this, on this place first, and uh, why on this place and not this place. And for this, you need to to map where the birds are going. So you could have observation for this, but it's not so precise. So you maybe need a new a new technique to to see this. And you, my dream is to put a GPS on bird now and try to follow them every day and see exactly how how many times they they go on this place, on this place, on this place, and correlate it to to snow melting and so green index, for example. So you can match satellite data and uh, GPS data, for example, and maybe you have very good measures. <laughs> so that's the next step. Yeah. So research we saw was a, a big question, then a more precise question with an hypothesis, a protocol to test it, and maybe results to get. But it's also a scientist. And when I was a kid, I always thought that a scientist basically uh, was this so a geek with a very large brain, uh, mainly male, and uh, in a white blouse and staying in a university lab. And then uh, when I look at Anne, uh, well, you seem to have uh, two arms, two legs, a brain. You're not a male, so okay, maybe a scientist is not exactly what I thought um, they were. So a scientist is mainly someone who uses, uh, I mean an ecologist at least, is someone that uses uh, his or her legs to actually go to the field and spend some time uh, going to the field and using um, his or her uh, eyes to actually look at things very closely. It's also someone who is a bit inventive and wanting to have fun. If you're in the field and you don't have the equipment, the proper equipment, then you need to find ways to go around. So if you don't have a ladder, then you take another scientist and go on his shoulders, shoulders to repair the, um, uh, the, the automated station. And it's also uh, still having a brain and staying in the lab and, uh, and using your brain to actually do some statistics and do some observation. Here, I think you were doing some genetics on this, uh, on this picture. So being a scientist is really much more than just doing, staying in front of a computer or uh, are working only with your brain, also, although it's it's this also, but it's being passionate about your about your topic. It's uh, being persevering because you need to be quite consistent over the years uh, to pursue your your subject of study, and it's also being very very curious at all time, asking uh, yourself questions. And ecology, it's it's, it's uh, particular because you have to be. Uh, to do lots of various things. So you, you have to kill the birds, you have to go and feed, you have to manage data, you have to you have to do lots of different things. It's not like only lab or it's very various activities. So that's very exciting. So for you, who's the scientist on this uh, on this picture? All of them, yeah, exactly. Why would you say all of them? I didn't know that actually young kids could be. Yeah. You're all working. Yeah. <laughs> you don't think they're having fun? <laughs> they can. Yeah. They like they're all Yeah. So yeah, they're all scientists. Um, they're not all Einstein for sure. They're not uh, like researchers with a Nobel Prize. 
but they're all doing some observation that actually uh, help us in our in our study. So they're all uh, doing a program that is called Phenotheme, and that uh, you will be doing, if not now, at least in uh, in spring. And they're all contributing to bringing this data and understanding how uh, uh, ecology works in, in the mountain. So they're all uh, volunteers, except for Daphne, who is uh, actually working for CREA and doing uh, analyzing all the data that you will be collecting. But all of them, otherwise, they're working for, uh, for science. So that's uh, my only recommendation is that we need you for ecology and uh, if you go to the field and do some observation just uh, remember to ask yourself questions all the time and you will find answer and when you don't find answer then ask scientists to help you find the answer so um, that's uh, that's all for us and uh, if you have questions uh, to any of us then You mentioned that our data that we collect today is going to help. Mm -hmm. uh, our data will go to CREA also. Yeah. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, how our data today might be used in the future um, mm -hmm. and, and if, we're, if it's part of a bigger um, study that we're assisting with or if this is an independent study or if you can talk about how what sure. the work that everyone here is going to do today is going to be impactful for your organization. So today, uh, you're going to the field and do an inventory. So this data will be used more internally for your own study sites in the long term. But what you will be doing um, close to the, uh, to the school uh, is following uh, some of the trees uh, during spring and autumn. So maybe you, you're going to start now, and if not, um, uh, for spring. And we will come back to really explain to you what the protocol is about. Uh, but basically, what we're trying to measure is uh, do trees change their, um, their phenology, that is the dates at which they, they do bird burst or flourish or lose their leaves or change colors um, because of climate. Uh, when climate changes, when it's colder or warmer, do they change, uh, do they come earlier in, in spring or do they last longer in, in fall? So basically you will observe every week these trees close to, to the school, and uh, this will go directly to our database, and we will uh, analyze the data, and you will also analyze the data, because uh, your teachers now have a set of data that you can work on, um, and uh, you will actually do yourself the analysis of, uh, of uh, does climate change something for the trees? Um, yeah, and what is important, uh why it's important to have a new stu new site like like yours, or, uh, because you have, we have already lots of uh, observation in in the France in France in the French Alps, but it's important to have more points everywhere, and and mainly it's important for us to have lots of points at different altitudes because we try to understand how the trees respond by altitude. So that's the uh, trees which are upper in altitude uh, are more affected by climate change than lowlands, for example. Um, so it's important for us to have uh, more points. So you are, it's very useful for us to, to have a gradient like you are doing lots of points at different altitudes here, and in a different part of the Alps for us. So big challenge. Yeah, and you will, you will have data from other schools elsewhere, or not schools, elsewhere in the Alps, and you, they will have the, your data also to... Yeah, you, to you can compare your data for, from here to another region, for example, and see what's the difference. To those so scientists, maybe? And it's, yeah, it's very interesting to, to know the difference between all the Alps. They're doing the same in France, so maybe you can exchange data with them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So don't forget to have fun in the field. <laughs>